Maria Margaret presents. When icons were destroyed, they were thrown on the ground, they were burned. Some people managed to secretly take them away. Sometimes communists would go into people's houses to confiscate and burn them. Every man finds his path to God in his heart. And a lot here depends on where he grew up, what his background is, who were his father and mother, his grandfather and grandmother. This is the road to Hirana village. It's 30 kilometers away from Arzamas in the Nizhny Novgorod region. In the 16th century, Tsar Ivan the Terrible endowed Denis Khilin with an estate here. The landlords would come and go, but one surname left a man-made legacy in history. The Pachyatins. It was them who presented the village with a unique heritage building in the Baroque style. The Church of the Beheading of St. John the Baptist. Designed by the famous architect Vasily Bajenov. This is how the quarterfile two-story church with a bell tower looked. It retained this appearance for nearly 180 years. Then, the year 1937 came, and no one cared anymore to stop this unique architectural heritage building, dating back to the second half of the 18th century, from falling apart. During a thunderstorm in May 2004, the octagonal structure of the church collapsed along with the dome, the tower, and the cupola, breaking through the ceiling of the ground floor. Now, all that remained of the church was the two-storied carcass. Scared children screamed, the church fell down. And it wasn't just the church that was destroyed. The villagers' hopes of reviving their church and their village collapsed with it. The youth began to leave the area in search of work. Some were lucky to find jobs nearby. Fortunately, the managers at the Arzamas Instrument Engineering Factory are natural-born organizers. They didn't just automate the manufacturing process, they also improved the workers' and engineers' skills and their living standards. First of all, we train people in the technical college that functions at the planted factory and also at the branch of the Nizhny Novgorod University of Technology. People come to work for us and here they train right at their workplace. Unfortunately, many young people look for their path in life in big cities such as Nizhny Novgorod or Moscow and it makes it even more difficult for us to create such conditions here that would make them want to stay, that would be attractive to them and would keep them at their workplaces. That's why the factory applies these efforts regularly and systematically and for now, thank God, we have been successful at it. I can say one thing, we've been very lucky with our shareholder. Their salaries are always paid in time and they're regularly sent to the nearby Moskovsky Recreation Center and Retreat. There was a time when Khirina village was known not just for its black earth soils, but also for its high standard of living. The chronicles of Khirina as a village date back to 1621, when Prince Ivan Pachatin built a wooden log church here. And in 1758, the prince's grandson, Alexei, erected in place of the wooden church a stone one that equaled in beauty and richness those of the capital. The architectural complex consisted of a lower and an upper church and a separately standing bell tower. According to the preserved accounts, in 1903, as Nikolai II and his wife were on their way to the canonization of the relics of Serafim Sarovsky, they stopped here to worship in this church. The Russian Tsar dreamed of having an heir to the throne. 
Whether it was a miracle or not, just a year later, Prince Alexei was born to the royal family. In the troubled years, the royal family was eliminated and so were many Orthodox relics. According to old local residents, the church of the beheading of St. John the Baptist was saved from annihilation by the church keeper Besonova, who managed to convince the Soviet authorities to use the village church as a warehouse. It was much later that the derelict building was turned into ruins. When I was this small, we boys climbed everything here. It was so interesting for us. It's hard to explain such coincidences, but exactly eight years to the day after the fall of the octagonal structure along with its dome, the first service was held to bless the restoration works. It was conducted by Metropolitan Bishop Georgi of Nizhny Novgorod and Arzamas. Back then, not many people believed that the work to rebuild the church would ever be completed, because in 2008, the money had already been spent. The scaffolds were in place, but then the work came to a halt. Once we were traveling here with a priest, and we started talking about our church, and he said, No, nobody will rebuild it. There'll be no parish here. Many didn't live to see the day, but we still believed it would happen. If it's in God's will, all of it will be rebuilt. Before her retirement, Vera Vanyasheva worked as a village librarian. When a descendant of one of the original locals decided to rebuild this church, Vera was asked to collect historic materials. This is how several surprising and hard to explain facts about this church were discovered. There was an interesting occurrence in this church in 1940. It had already been ruined for three years, and suddenly in summer, people started hearing the singing of our church choir. It was a great choir. The voices were so beautiful. Everyone from around here would come to listen to this singing, and the communists would tell people to leave, and that these were pigeons cooing, not the choir singing. They couldn't believe it. But there's an opinion that it was the church weeping on the eve of the Great Patriotic War. This derelict house opposite the main entrance to the Arzamas church speaks eloquently of the crash of an era of militant atheism. By divine providence, or perhaps an ironic twist of fate, the socialist leader who stood at the root of the horrendous destruction of churches is now forever gazing at the main Arzamas church. In the 30s, they wanted to blow this church up, but the locals would not allow that to happen. Then it was turned into communal rooms for prisoners. Services resumed here in 1947. Voskresensky Cathedral is considered to be a monument of Russian ecclesiastical architecture of the classical period. Nowadays, pilgrims from all over the country make their way here. Its beauty and architectural grandeur is often compared to that of St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg. Sadly, the original interiors were not preserved. But these bicolored frescoes have successfully been restored. The main relics in the cathedral, particularly worshipped by the parishioners, are the holy, life-giving cross of the Lord, the appearance of which in Arzamas is explained in a legend and the carved icon of St. Nicholas the Wonderworker, which in Orthodox tradition is called Nicholas of Marzhaisk. The facts of the miraculous powers of these relics are passed by word of mouth and attract hundreds and thousands of people to the cathedral. Another relic particularly worshipped by the people of Arzamas is the Serafima Panitaevskaya icon of the Mother of God, the sign. Once during a prayer in the monastery, the nuns noticed that the face of the Holy Mother suddenly lit up and her eyes turned to them, looking up. That sign was repeated and the icon was recognized as a miracle maker. Its very first replica was given to this cathedral. Valentina Salova came to the first service in this Christian cathedral with that same icon in 2012. Today is such a special day, such a celebration, you have no idea. 
What does the revival of this church mean to you? I have no words. I'm sorry. I prayed to our Lord. I asked him. I said, may the grace of God descend upon the village Hirina and the Christian church, and may the right people get the wisdom to lead the restoration of our church. So our prayer must have been heard. And this man appeared. In 2011, Russian scientist and businessman Igor Ashubeli discovered his historical roots in the village of Hirina. His great-grandfather on his mother's side, Grigory Rezanov, a hereditary mason and stove setter, lived here before moving to Baku. When I found out about these roots of mine, I decided to help the existing church. And we came here and learned that the church was not functioning, that it was ruined. We decided to restore it. Only it looked very small in the picture. So when they showed me the picture, I said, well, if it's ruined, we'll restore it. Then when I arrived here and saw the volume of work that needed to be done, it was a little bit scary. But what the eye fears, the hands do. To restore the Christian sanctuary, Igor Ashubeli set up the foundation of St. John the Baptist. And so the intensive work began. At the start of the 20th century, Christian stonemasons were considered to be among the best. For that reason, they were employed at the factories of the Nobel Brothers Partnership. This is how Igor Ashubeli's maternal great-grandfather, Grigory Rizanov, came to live in Baku in 1910. There he worked as a stove setter. At the same time, Igor's paternal great-grandfather, Haji Mehdi Kelobek Ashurbekov, a nobleman by birth and a landlord from the Baku Vice Regency, ceded a part of his oil-bearing ancestral land in the villages near Baku to the Nobels. Most of the stove setters working at the big factories of the city were from Hirna. Grigory Rizanov didn't plan to live in a strange land, but that was how his fate turned. In Russia, the revolution took place, and the Rizanov family became entwined with the ancient family of the Asherbekovs. This was how, in 1963, their descendant, Igor Asherbeli, was born. Did he live in Baku? Yes, in Baku. So he lived in Baku. And my mother-in-law's older sister was their nanny. Her name was Maria Artimonova. I'd like to meet Igor and talk to him. Here, dip the bread in salt. May God give you good health, I'll say first, and may God help you in restoring our church. It's not mine. Mine or not mine, what I like. Give me the towel. Not without a permission, I won't. You were born in Baku, right? Yes. Was Maria Artimonova taking care of someone in Baku? Yes, and then she left. In 1965, she returned to Hirina. Yes. Her relatives are here. This is her younger brother, Vasily. Yes. That's how this life brought us together. It's a small world. That's where Vera told her relative a secret she'd kept for over 20 years. At the end of the 1930s, the keepers of the Hirana church, the Besonov sisters, one night secretly took two ancient icons out of the church. This is one of them. God Almighty. Was it through divine providence or simply coincidence? But the icon always chose its own saviors, as if it knew that one day it would be Vera's relative who would restore the church. They kept this icon for 50 years, and when they felt they were at their life's end, they asked me to keep it. I kept it at home, also with caution. The residents of here in the village knew that I was its keeper, they would come, look at it, pray. They knew I had it. But of course, I wouldn't let any strangers know about it. To be honest, I was afraid. I was scared. Please 
Please follow me. This is Vera Vanyasheva's bedroom. For a quarter of a century, Vera didn't leave this precious icon unattended for one single day. Here is the place. This icon, the sign, was here together with the other icons. But now I took them down and placed them here. Right on this shelf? Yes, yes. Is where the icon remained for 25 years. That's right. Did you cover it up when strangers came here? Yes. In 2013, this icon returns to the church. That was in September, during the consecration of the lower church. The temple was built in the shape of a cross and has two floors. The lower one is occupied by the warm church and the upper one by a cold church. Despite the cold autumn rain, the event was attended by over 1,500 people from far and wide. For many, the revival of the church symbolized the revival of the Russian village. That day, there was a celebration, which has since become a regular tradition. It's a very unusual place. It's the first time we're here. The church is very beautiful, and the celebration will be wonderful, despite these terrible weather conditions. No one believed anymore that it would be revived like that, honestly. It fell down completely two years ago, and that was it. We thought it would be demolished. And now it suddenly rose from the ashes. That's not the first church to be restored by Igor Ashibeli. During the renovation of a health center in Moscow, the workers found a white stone foundation. Research showed that there were fragments of an apse from an altar and a porch. That's how the Church of the Righteous Martyr Elizabeth appeared in Pokrovsky Sresnyov. This church, for me, this church is the first sanctuary that was built from scratch by a single person. Usually they're built by many different people, all working together, but here a man just asked for the blessing and, and built what may be a small one, but a proper church. Igor's a deeply religious person, and this isn't the first time that he's helped build and restore a church. He does a lot of charity work. He always puts his heart and soul into it, and these works are done with the blessing of the Patriarch of Russia. This church turned out to be just dreamlike, very beautiful and cozy. Since 2012, Igor Ashubeli has organized the first pilgrimage in history to follow the relics of the White Angel of Moscow. This was the name given to the Grand Duchess Elizabeth Romanova, Mother Superior of the Marfa Marinsky Convent. Just like other noble members of the royal family, 95 years ago she was brutally murdered by the Bolsheviks. Together with others, she was thrown alive into a mine near Alapayevsk in the Urals. And in 1992, she was canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church. The first pilgrims were given a blessing by Patriarch Kirill of Moscow and all Russia to follow this route. He also blessed Igor Ashibeli's work to rebuild the St. John the Baptist Church in Khirina. There you go. Igor saw it. What a beautiful view from here. I tell him, come to live here with me. It took just three years to restore the St. John the Baptist Church. By comparison, in the 18th century, it took 19 years to build. 
In September 2014, Metropolitan Gyorgy of Nizhny Novgorod and Arzamas consecrated the altar of the upper church and held a communion service. Throughout this time, the Metropolitan Bishop substantially supported the project. Now, the church looks just as it did over two centuries ago. This church's architecture is indeed unique. It's quite complex, and normally they wouldn't build such opulent churches in villages. It remains a mystery to us what made our ancestors decide to do it. You know, even now it's not easy for us to recreate it. So it's surprising that two and a half centuries ago, our ancestors ventured to build this beauty. They had neither cranes nor cars. And now we can see this church as a reflection of the beauty of the souls of our forefathers. We aspire to better our souls too. The entrance to the upper church is accessed through the wide staircases on the three sides that are supported by broad pillars. The doors of the church are connected by terraces that surround the cross-shaped body of the building on all sides except to the east. Historians consider the iconography of the Mother of God, known as the life-giving spring, to be the enigma of Kirana. Indeed, if you look at the church from east to west, it's easy to see the contour of the iconic image of the church's outline. Viewing the church from a bird's vantage point, the contours of the octagonal structure with the tower are identical to the outline of the goblet in the icon. To build the church, a lot of archive materials had to be studied. This is how the history of the village was put together and was published in the Hirana Chronograph. This is a work of fundamental historical value. During the now traditional Village Day celebration, in the central square, villagers are greeted by various craftsmen who come to the event from all over the region. The celebration began with giving of awards to the icon painters, artists and handymen. Handyman Vasily Murata. Handyman Alexei Salivana. Did you expect it? No, not at all. How will you celebrate it at home? I'll sit at a table with my family and friends and we'll celebrate this event. Why are you tearful? It's happiness. I'm just happy, that's all, because we did such a good thing. I've seen a lot of churches being restored and monasteries being consecrated. But this is the first time that I see workers being given awards. Now I see that without our benefactor, who you represent, this church would definitely not be here. That's for sure. Sergei Sidorin is a bell ringer at the Hirana church. By training, he's a military engineer. His family is from Shatkovsky district near Hirana. When he was offered the chance to move here to work, he didn't think twice. I don't have any special church training. I was lucky to serve together with Father John. And he would hold my hands and place them on the ropes and say in my ear, love our God and go to church, love our God and go to church. That's how I learned bell ringing. Vera Vanyasheva recalls that in the old times, there were only two bells here. This bell was made here in Hirina, in the south part of the village. It bears an inscription, 1864, Arzamas Guildmaster Vasily Dmitriev, weighs 20 stones and 5 pounds, which is nearly 330 kilograms. This bell hang in the bell tower. 
There were three of them. One was made for the first project and weighed 300 puds. That bell is in Sarov now. Then they changed the project a bit and made the second one weighing 160 puds. It's this one here. It was dropped when they took it down and there were fragments that the villagers kept for a long time. I held one of the fragments with St. John the Baptist on it. He was dressed in animal skin. To look at this beautiful church today, it's hard to believe that just three years ago, there was a completely different scene here. When I entered here for the first time, which was 15 years ago, here at the altar they melt cows. I was appalled. I felt like crying. It was impossible to go up the bell tower because everything here was in ruins. The church had no dome. Only the altar remained standing and they milked cows there. It was a sorry sight. But now it's worlds different. You can see for yourself how delightful it is here, how beautiful. And all these changes happen in just three years. That's a real miracle. It's God's miracle, God's grace. It's so nice and pleasant. It's a pity our husbands didn't live to see such a marvelous church. She is 82 and she wants to dance. Did you recall how we used to have fun here before? Well, my dear, we'd go to Gorky to listen to the hearing a choir. Yes, they too had a choir here. Yes, we too had a choir here, dear. The stage was on fire and we still continued to dance and sing. Today they opened a Christian church here. Also, it's very beautiful inside the church. They put beautiful walls in there and beautiful lamps. A person who restored the church should always have an expression of happiness on his face, kindness, sympathy. He did a very good thing for people. I would, everyone would do the same in his place. All the good people would. It's always looked like this, right? Why are we here then? No reason. Now with this beauty returned, the restoration of the Russian village Hirina, once rich and happy, also will begin again. And to look at this church now, hardly anyone would believe that in its place there used to be ruins. Only the brass plate with the names of the church warden and other patrons will serve as a reminder of this 21st century man-made miracle. One can only hope that the surname Ashubeli, together with that of the Puchatin princes, will take their well-deserved place in the history of Hirina village, in the Shatkovsky district of Arzamas parish, in the Nizhny Novgorod region.